Hey everyone, uh, looks like we have uh, some people in here, so uh, let's just get started. Uh, just for you guys that don't know, my name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm the founder of Scout, as well as uh, our other few apps. And um, you know, if you don't already know the purpose of these webinars, really it's about, uh, not really about Scout, uh, this is more about just helping small businesses, helping people like you, uh, kind of go further with your business and further with your marketing and further with just your overall attitude and your overall strategy uh, for finding success. So the first uh, webinar you should have already seen uh, just goes quickly through what Scout is, um, but every subsequent webinar after this, this one being the first one, uh, is about, like I said, actual strategies and tactics that you can start using today and tomorrow, uh, et cetera. So this is the first one. Uh, the first one that we're doing here is really about this topic, which is how can small businesses win against big businesses? Uh, the reason that we're doing this one first uh, is, uh, you know, given my, given where I am with Scout and given uh, just, you know, the opportunities that I have of talking to merchants. Uh, I think since over the past one year, I've probably conservatively spoken to at least 250 businesses on Shopify. Um, and starting to learn about their problems and their concerns and really what keeps them up at night and things like that. One of the common, common ones uh, that I think is a not an irrational fear, it's a very rational fear, but it's a fear of, against the big brands. It's a fear against the big businesses like Amazon, like Walmart, Ikea, Home Depot, PetSmart, really whoever that big 800 pound gorilla is in your vertical. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, although I understand where that concern and that frustration and that kind of, um, you know, you know, being afraid comes from, there's still a lot of advantages that I think we as small businesses have. And I think it's very important for us to remind ourselves about what those advantages are, because once we know those advantages, then we can leverage those advantages and win out. So that's the purpose of this video. Uh, this webinar is to talk about reminding what, the, what those advantages are and examples of how we can use those advantages. So in terms of the agenda, this will be about a 20 minute session. Uh, it might go over a little bit. That's just because I get really passionate about whatever I'm talking about and I go on and on about it. But my goal is to keep this at about 20 minutes. Um, we're gonna start off just first by talking about Sun Tzu's Art of War, which is one of my favorite books and kind of what they say about advantages and strengths and weaknesses in, in war, which is kind of a, you know, another word that you can use for business even. Uh, and then we'll go straight into what those lists of advantages are, which I have listed out here, personal relationships, options and opportunities, and agility. So we'll go through those three examples uh, along with real life examples of how us businesses are doing that successfully. So getting started, uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War. For those of you that don't know what Sun Tzu's Art of War is, it's a book that was written about 2,500 years ago, and it's become like this, almost like Bible of uh, how to do battle. Um, obviously the context is very much in the context of war. Uh, the story behind it is that Sun Tzu was the general of an army of 10,000 people, uh, but he was using these strategies and tactics they were able to win out against an army of 100,000 people. So 10 times bigger, they were able to win out. And so he listed all of these principles out into this book in these 13 chapters. Um, now, the first chapter that they go into is very, very much like the preface for the rest of the book. The way the book is laid out is also very strategic. And chapter one is all about research and doing your homework. And Sun Tzu goes on to say this quote, which is, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of 100 battles, which is to say that if you know your own strengths and weaknesses and you know your enemies or your, you know, the big businesses' strengths and weaknesses, and you obviously play to your strengths and avoid your weaknesses, then you can be confident in going to battle 100 out of 100 times. Mm -hmm. Now, to put this in a diagram, what this basically means is what you want to do by playing to your advantages and playing to your strengths is to create an is to create a unfair advantage for yourself. Right. Um, this is one other quote that I like from Master Splinter from Ninja Turtles, which you can find on Netflix. Um, the cartoon series. Mas I think this, this, first of all, this show on Netflix, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like you need to be watching the show because every, almost everything that Master Splinter says is like so wise. 
And one of the things he says uh, was like, Leonardo comes back from a battle defeated. They got kind of jumped by, you know, Shredder and his foot soldiers and they got owned. Uh, and he comes back to Master Splinter. He's like, oh, it was an unfair fight. We lost. It was not fair. You know, we would have won. I mean, you know, it just, it had too many people. And it's just not a fair fight. So then Master Splinter gets mad at him and he says, well, what did you want? Like, did you want fairness or did you want victory? Because rest assured that your enemy is looking for victory, not fairness. So that really kind of opened Leonardo's eyes. It opened my eyes as well because it makes sense. Uh, in business, just like in war, that's saying you know, all this fear and love in war. It's the same thing with business. It's all fair. Uh, just because a business is bigger doesn't mean that they're going to step back and give you an advantage just because they're bigger than you. That's not how this works. Um, and if you're a small person, if you're a small business, that's your responsibility to then avoid those fights and fight where you have advantages or build on those advantages. So this chart basically kind of explains that, which is your chances of winning, your chances of profiting are much, much, much higher when you're in that, in that space where you have that advantage, right? If your advantage as a business owner is your ability to give really, really, really good customer service, then you need to create the environment where that customer service is put on the forefront to your customers. That means that your website should have a lot of call to actions to get on the phone with you. That means that your phone number should be nice and big and available on all the pages. That means that uh, when you're running your Facebook ads, run a campaign again around getting people on the phone rather than trying to make a purchase. So like you want it, if whatever your advantages are, you need to drive your customers to experience that advantage so that they can convert with you. Uh, now I'll give you an example on this because I know so many of us and so many of you even uh, use Facebook uh, and Facebook ads to drive traffic to your site and rely on Facebook for a lot of your conversions. Um, Facebook is something that's becoming really saturated. I'm sure you guys have already experienced this. The guys that were doing Facebook advertising years and years ago, they can tell you that it's really different today than it used to be, you know, five, five years ago. And um, the reason why is because bigger businesses are now getting onto Facebook. And I'll get into this lesson a little bit later, which is about the option, uh, sorry, the options and opportunities uh, element, which will come later in this webinar. But basically what's happening is that these big banks and insurance companies and car companies and big furniture companies and real estate agents and all these kind of really kind of big businesses that exist already are getting on Facebook and running their campaigns on Facebook now, whereas five years ago, they didn't do that. Now, what that means is that Facebook is now being flooded with organizations with bigger budgets. And that means that Facebook has to, I mean, Facebook can obviously run unlimited ads. There's a certain number of people on Facebook that spend a certain number of time on Facebook. Um, and there's only a certain number of scrolls that the average user do. So there's only a certain number of ads that the average user is even gonna spend time looking at. And so there's a limited number of, there's a limited demand basically in terms of the customer demand for advertising, but the supply is really large and the supply of really big businesses is also growing. So that means that it's getting more and more expensive to advertise on Facebook. So I'll give you an example. Before I quit my job and started doing my online store full time and started developing apps for Shopify and e-commerce uh, stores full time, I was a technology and marketing consultant for some of the biggest uh, organizations in Canada, one of them being one of the biggest banks. Um, I won't say who because of the confidentiality and stuff, but uh, they are a top four bank in Canada. Their logo is green. Anyway, I was working for their car and home insurance uh, section, their division, basically with the goal being to drive a lower cost of customer acquisition. Now, what I learned was that they actually just started advertising on Facebook about two years ago. So that means that when Facebook advertising was really growing, they were again slow on the scene, scene as all big businesses are, they'll get there slowly. Um, but now that they're there, their average customer acquisition cost that they're willing to kind of spend happily is about $700 uh, per acquisition. So because they're selling car insurance and home insurance, they know that the lifetime value of anyone that buys their insurance is going to be in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. Right? If you get car insurance, you're going to be spending, let's say, 300 bucks, 200 bucks a month for five years. And that comes to be thousands and thousands of dollars. And if they obviously resign, then it's tens of thousands and so much more. That's why it makes sense for these companies to spend $700 just to acquire a customer because, again, their LTV uh, is so high. 
Now, if you're selling diet plans or nutrition plans or dietary supplements, um, and the average order value that you have is, let's say, $100, you're not going to spend $700 to acquire a customer. You're not going to pay Facebook $700. Maybe you'll pay $10. Maybe you'll pay $20 for a customer acquisition. Maybe you'll even pay up to $50 or $60. But who do you think Facebook is going to try to favor, right? Is Facebook going to give more of their traffic to the insurance company that is spending $700 per acquisition? Or are they going to give you more of a thing, uh, more uh, kind of... Uh, better quality traffic to you who's only going to pay 10 or 20 or $30. Like it's 10 times more profitable for them to, uh, to support the big guys. So that's why, you know, everything like with Facebook getting saturated is happening, but the, bringing this back to the lesson here is that when you're doing Facebook ads to drive traffic, you're actually playing in your disadvantage zone. You're actually, you're actually in your disadvantage zone here, um, which is the, the chances of, winning, AKA profiting is way lower, right? You're playing in an, in an arena where the chances of you driving a good profit is going down and down. What you want to do is you want to be running your campaigns in areas where you have advantages. This is where it, it makes more sense. I think for small businesses using the example of Facebook, Facebook ads is to run your retargeting ads on Facebook rather than traffic driving ads on Facebook. You see what I mean? Because now you have customers that already know who you are and have already maybe taken an action, maybe even added to cart. It's a, it's a, it's a cart recovery uh, retargeting campaign. But you have a way higher chance of success because that's a customer that already knows you, that already almost bought from you. So you'd rather focus your marketing dollars on those than focusing your marketing dollars somewhere where you know, you're going to lose. So... So again, where those advantages lie, we're going to be talking about this whole area. We're going to talk about what are some of these examples that we have where we can live on this side of the curve. Um, and so I've listed three here. Now, there's obviously a lot more than three. There could be thousands, even millions, depending on what business you have and where your advantages lie. But I think these three generally apply for all small businesses. So I'll just talk about these three. But again, there's a lot more than this. First is the personal relationships. It's something that big businesses can't do because there's not enough employees to develop a personal relationship with each one of their customers, obviously. The other one is options and opportunities. There are a lot more small, small opportunities than there are big opportunities, just like fish in the sea. There's more small fish in the sea than there are big fish in the sea. Same thing works with opportunities here uh, on land and in our market and our economy. There's more opportunity, small opportunities than big opportunities. Um, and in terms of agility, um, small businesses are smaller, they're more agile, they can turn faster, they can move and try different experiments faster. Um, and there's just less process and bureaucracy stopping them from accomplishing something. Whereas big businesses have a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of process and a lot of red tape. So we were talking about these three things and examples of uh, ways to leverage each one of these three. So first, personal relationships. Um, you know, I think this is a really big, advantage because pers I, I see that the world is changing and the way that we do business is changing as customers, right? Looking at all of these stores on, on uh, online, drop shipping stores, even the big Walmart type, Amazon type stores, what's happening is that pricing is, prices are coming down and quality is getting up, is getting better, right? Machines are getting better, more efficient, materials are getting easier to source, more efficient, stronger, uh, and pricing is coming down because as a result, as in a function of quality getting better and processes becoming more and more commoditized. So you're already seeing prices come down and quality go up, and that's happening across the board for all competitors. Now, now so how do you, how do you differentiate yourself, right? Five, 10 years ago, people would say, oh, well, our quality is much better. We're better because our quality is better or we're better, customers will prefer us because their pricing is better. But again, those are no longer factors that you can win now. Um, I think that in the future, it's going to be about these two elements, passion and customer relationships, right? Big businesses don't have really much passion. If you have a parent, or maybe even you have a side, this is your side hustle, maybe your full-time job is you work at a bank or, or you work at a, tel like a, a telco or AT&T or something. Um, how much passion does the person next to you have about the business that they're in, right? I don't think that, you know, a car salesman like, is like love selling cars. I don't think someone who works for customer service at, 
you know, Bank of America loves what Bank of America does and very passionate about Bank of America. I don't think that's that's true. And most customers also know that that's not true, right? Uh, and then same thing with the customer relationships because the businesses are so big and they have so many customers, there's obviously, you know, a limit for how personal and how, um, you, know, sp uh, you know, relevant a relationship can be created between the business and the customer. Now with small businesses, it's a totally different story. It's totally the other side of the coin. You're in this business, you're doing this side hustle, you started this business because you have this, you know, you, this passion for what you do, right? And if you have this passion, your customers will see it or they'll hear it over the phone, they'll see it in your story, they'll see it on your website, they'll see it on the video, on your YouTube channel. They'll know that you have a passion for what you do. And again, customer relationship wise, as a small business, you need to talk to your customers and you have the ability to talk to your customers because you don't have as many customers as the next guy. You have enough time in your day where you can pick up the phone and talk to your best customers, right? Someone who just bought for their fourth time, fifth time, you can get the, that's what scouts actually built for is to alert you. Hey man, that person just bought for their fourth time. Here's your phone number. Maybe you want to give them a call or an abandoned checkout. Hey, this person just abandoned $4,000 worth of canoes on your store. You should probably talk to them. It's $4,000 Here's their phone number, build that relationship. They can, you can reach out, learn about their needs, learn about their wants, learn really what their problem is. Uh, and then service that problem and then earn that trust with the customer that you know what you're talking about and you're the right person to meet their needs. But that's an advantage, it's a huge advantage that small businesses have. An example that I'll tell you on this is one of our merchants called Treats Happen. Uh, they sell dog treats and dog food. It's like uh, really healthy, it's organic, it's grain free and it's like really, really good for your dogs. Um, but you know, they're obviously, they're a small business. Um, they are growing though, but they're a small business and their competitors are these big, you know, Unilever, PNG brands that are being sold in, you know, the grocery stores and PetSmart and things like that. And, uh, you know, it can be tough to compete against these people that have all the distribution, but what they do differently and what really drove their growth came from customer retention. Because when somebody was the first person to buy, when somebody bought from their store for the first time, somebody from their business would reach out and get to learn more about their dog. Like what breed are they? How old are they? What's their personality like? What do they list like? What do they like? Um, and they started basically building a community around dog owners where it was very clear that the brand cared about each one of their dogs. They knew their dog's birthdays. And on the birthday, they would send them a huge discount on or even free treats um, if they were signed up on a subscription. So, you know, this really kind of grew their store and they've been doubling every year for the past five years, which is like, a, which is a great place to be if you're a small business owner. So again, this was a way that they leveraged the ability to create personal relationships to drive that retention and to create like you know, really strong VIP customers. The next example, the second advantage that I want to talk about is a really, really interesting advantage that I think not very many people think about kind of top of mind, but it's something that should be top of mind, which is that the number of opportunities that we as small businesses have is more than the number that big businesses have. Like I mentioned, there's more small fish in the sea than there are big fish in the sea, but big businesses are only really designed to go after the big fish, to only go after the big businesses. Now, the reason why is because of an opportunity cost in the big business. For a big business, they already know that they're going to be making a million dollars a week, let's say. They already know based on our current distribution channels, selling through PetSmart, selling through Home Depot, selling through whatever the channels are with our existing online and SEO strategy and blog and everything, we make a million bucks a week, right? They, they just know it. All of their processes that are in place in that organization are designed to keep that wheel spinning, right? To make sure that they keep doing everything they need to do to get a million dollars a week. They're not so much focused on growth as they are on maintenance. And to maintain it, they have to have a certain size of opportunity for it to even make sense for them to do. I'll give you a really quick example. Let's say this small opportunity here that you're seeing uh, is a farmer's market. It's a small farmer's market that happens in the middle of a, of a decently sized city that happens you know, once every you know, month, once a month. And it's, again, there's maybe only a few thousand people that will maybe even show up to the farmer's market. Uh, for a big business, this opportunity is too small because 
for them to execute and plan and kind of you know do everything they need is not just about budget. It's about do their employees have the time to put and the effort to put into this. Well, it might take a month for ten people on their marketing team to plan. So now basically they have to spend ten months salary of one person to just focus on this one opportunity. Now it's likely that they probably won't even break even on that then, right? If if they if they're paying let's say each one of their employees a hundred thousand dollars a year just to round it out, uh, that means that they're let's say they're paying ten thousand dollars a month. Now there's ten months that they have to pay a hundred thousand dollars to that team in terms of just salary to even execute on this. They probably won't even make hundred thousand dollars in revenue. They might not even make twenty thousand. They might only make five thousand dollars in revenue. So again, the opportunity is too small for the big business because those same ten employees are working on other opportunities that are getting a million bucks a week, right? So it doesn't make sense for them to do these small opportunities. But as a small business, this is small enough for you to do because the opportunity it puts you in a profit. You don't have to pay a team of ten people to do this. You know that you only need to do a couple hours of work um, and get make sure that everything's kind of in place, and then you can go 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 there and do that. This is the small business advantage, right? As you can see, there's more small markets, more more small opportunities, and there are big opportunities. If th this big business doesn't fit in the small opportunity, it doesn't even fit. This is also the other uh, concept of innovators dilemma, where a big business cannot innovate, not because they don't have the ability or the technical skills or the people or the money, because obviously they have all of them, but what they don't have is the time and the effort and the processes to do that, right? If you look at IBM, like why did, you know, how did Kodak, that was a massive multi, multi-billion dollar photography company, lose to Instagram when they only had, Instagram only had 20 employees and Kodak had like thousands and thousands. Well, it's because Kodak's processes were all about that old school camera process of taking pictures. Whereas Instagram came up with a brand new idea, didn't make any money, nothing was just an app and they kind of rolled it out. For Kodak, it didn't make sense to do something like Instagram because it would just lose them money and Kodak's not in the business of losing money. Kodak is in the business of maintaining the revenue that they're already uh, getting. So again, it's the same, same concept here, right? If you're selling any goods, um, I'll get into the example now, uh, and I can use the example from my own store. Um, I started selling these handheld bidets, and I knew that there was a market opportunity for just Pakistanis and Indians that immigrated from Pakistan or India and moved to Toronto. Mm -hmm. You know, I just focus is very, very niche. It's Pakistan and Indian immigrants to Toronto. That was my market. Um, I know that my biggest competitor would be Home Depot and the brands that Home Depot carries, but Home Depot isn't targeting my demographic. Home Depot didn't even sell these products in all of their stores across Canada. Only very few stores even had them. Uh, but Home Depot is not going to run ads to uh, to sell this product to that specific niche. But I did. I only focused on that one opportunity. For Home Depot, it wouldn't make sense, right? Because maybe there's only a few thousand people that fit that. Maybe there's only 10. Maybe there's Maybe there's only 100,000 people that fit that opportunity. And if they only have a 1% conversion rate, that's only 1,000 people. So for Home Depot to do anything, to only sell 1,000 pieces of anything, isn't enough of an opportunity for them to focus on. But as a small business starting out, for me to sell 1,000 pieces of anything is a huge opportunity. So I just focused on that. Um, and you know, it was this kind of small opportunity here where you, know, you have, you know, potentially 100,000 people in this local market that need this product, that I know want this product, uh, and then I'll grow with it. I'll enter it, and then I'll grow, uh, and I'll grow with the market. And as I grow, I'll get other opportunities. Maybe I'll go to Vancouver, or maybe I'll go to New York next, maybe I'll go to Montreal next, which is basically how I grew my business. And now I've sold uh, almost 3,000 of these over the past three years, and that was only because I focused on this specific opportunity uh, that was in front of me. Next up, let's talk about the advantage number three, agility. Um, this is also one of my favorite advantages, uh, and it's because I feel like success in today's world uh, is so interesting to try to catch because it's almost like lightning in a bottle because things are changing so fast, right? Marketing and media channels are moving. Like every month, it's like there's a new app out there that everybody's talking about um, that channels that we watch, the shows that we watch is changing. We're binge watching now. We're not just, we're not watching a show over a five year period of time. We're watching a show like 
in a week and then we'll move on to the next show. Like everything is just becoming so much faster, shorter attention span, um, and things are changing so much. Technology is changing, the way that marketing is done, even track is changing. Uh, and so it's really, really interesting. Uh, and so that is a huge advantage because if you can stay small and stay agile with these every new app opportunity that comes up, that gives you a huge, huge advantage and that big businesses just can't do. So looking at this here, you know, a big business might have started several years ago, let's say selling um, uh, athletic wear, because my example is going to be Gymshark. Let's say, let's say this big business is Nike or Adidas, right? They started off a long time ago selling equipment to athletes. They had first mover advantage and, you know, everybody knows them and that's their, like, they've been able to capture, like, all this value all to themselves. This was the whole market uh, or the addressable market for them. Um, but what happened with Gymshark, which is an example I'll get into, they were able to get on the scene to learn from what the first guys did from Lululemon, Nike, and Adidas, learn what was working for them and say, you know what, we could do this too. And I think we could do it better. Uh, I think there's a gap in the market or there's a gap in they're not selling clothes specifically for power lifters or specifically for gym rats. They're, se they're selling it for basketball players, soccer players, runners, things like that. But they're not selling specifically for people that go to the gym to lift, we can do that. That was their second mover advantage. They learned, um, and uh, not only that, but they were small enough where they could learn from the new technology and the new channels coming up, and they really leveraged Instagram really well. So again, they were able to make more moves and run more marketing experiments and run more campaigns than their competitors so that they could learn a lot faster this new opportunity which was emerging, which was uh, gym rats, right? This, this small segment at the time, people thought, oh, there's not... There's more people that go running than people that are gym rats, but that market was growing and they grew with that market. Uh, you know, it's, it's this, it's uh, again, you know, the, the person that can make more moves in the same amount of time will win. Just like boxing, the person who can throw the most punches in the same amount of time will likely win. Even in soccer, the, the team that has more shots on goal has a more higher, way higher chance of winning. The team in basketball who takes, who gets more possessions and takes more shots has a more chance of winning. It's the same thing with business. If you have, if you put yourself in the position to take more shots than the big guys, you have a chance of winning in that segment. It's like if me and you were playing, playing chess and I was allowed to take two moves for every one move that you make, who do you think would win? It would be me every time, right? And again, it might sound like it's an unfair advantage, but again, going back to it, like we have to leverage our unfair advantages. One of the unfair advantages that we have is that we can make more moves, plain and simple. So then going, again, this is another diagram. I won't go into too much because I guess you can understand, but the bigger the business gets, uh, the higher uh, level of comfort and predictability and security they have, and therefore the lower they have the capacity to adapt because they'd rather They'd rather keep everything going and doing well and everyone being happy and everyone going home and getting their paycheck than to put people's jobs at risk or to put their customers at risk and do something that's really innovative if it kind of hurts their predictability of that campaign. If they know that they run this campaign and they get 100 installs every day just by this campaign, they're going to keep doing it. But if you would ask them, hey, instead of doing that, why don't you take a risk on this one? You have a 10% chance of hitting 10,000 installs, but you have a 90% chance of only hitting 10 installs. Like they'll be like, ah, you know what? I think we're happy with what we're doing now. We don't want to take a risk and lose these installs. So that's another, that's another, again, your risk appetite is also higher than them. So then with the example with Gymshark, I talked about it in length already, but basically what worked for them is they were small enough that they could do many experiments um, and they learned what was working. They basically learned that in Instagram was a huge channel for them and something they should leverage. They were on Instagram, they were executing successfully on Instagram even before Nike and Lululemon and Adidas had a proper Instagram marketing strategy. Right? It took Nike like a year to come up with an Instagram strategy, whereas Gymshark came up with it in a week and was already executing and had already learned what was working. But Gymshark learned that they basically started recruiting influencers on Instagram, people that had really kind of over 10,000 followers or even over 5,000 followers on Instagram. And they were kind of, you know, they were finding gym rats on Instagram that were posting kind of workout pictures on, on, uh, on Instagram and basically just sent them free stuff and said, Hey, we'd love it if you could wear our goods, um, you know, next time you're at the gym. 
because they knew that they would go to the gym and take pictures of themselves and post those pictures, which would then be the brand awareness that they wanted. This was a hugely successful move. Now their whole marketing campaign is really focused on recruiting these Instagram brand ambassadors and driving traffic this way. Uh, and all the benefit they've had from that is crazy too, because now when they launch a new campaign, they just have to tell, they just email all their brand ambassadors and say, hey, this is our new Black Friday offer, make sure you mention it. And now suddenly they have the thousands of influ uh, Instagram influencers they have and the, and the hundreds of millions of followers that all of them have put together are now suddenly seeing the, app, the, the, the offer at this, on the same day. Hugely, hugely successful. I mean, Gymshark went from, you know, being started in 2012 out of the dude's mom's garage, selling a few shirts here and there to now being a hundred million dollar business five, six years later is kind of crazy to even think was even possible. Like, you know, any business going from zero to a hundred million dollars in five years, five years ago or 10 years ago was unheard of. Now you're seeing Gymshark do it. Kylie Cosmetics is now going to be a billion dollar business in three years, four years, which again has never happened before. Um, and you know, even like Fashion Nova being something that never even existed a few years ago to now being on everyone's mind uh, or all their customers' minds. I mean, it's again, it's something that's never been heard of. Uh, and it's the advantage that they had as small businesses that gave them that advantage that now they are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It's because they were able to execute on more ideas learn faster, leverage new technology, leverage new mediums faster than the established brands could, learn faster, and then made the changes, again, much faster. So again, these are really, really important advantages that you shouldn't, um, you know, you shouldn't think that you don't have it, you don't have an advantage because you don't think that Amazon owns everything because you can. So just to wrap up, uh, I'm going to go go again uh, back to the first uh, one that I had here, basically. But look, you really want to play to your advantages. Uh, and what you can do starting tomorrow is just look, even if it's just the number one personal relationships, right? Understand who your customer is. Reach out to anyone who's in Bandit Checkout. Build a relationship. What did go wrong? How can we service you? What is it that you're looking for? How can we do this? Uh, sorry, the sun's uh, getting in my eye, but uh, it's all good. Uh, and, uh, and again, not just your abandoned cart customers, but contact your loyal customers or repurchase customer, anyone that spends more than your average order, just reach out, say, thank you, learn about them, build that relationship because these are the people that are going to grow your business and that you're going to learn from and learn about new opportunities, new product ideas. You know, you know, if somebody spends $400 on your store and the average order value is only hundred bucks, reach out to them, tell them, Hey, would you buy this other product? If I sold that, what do you think about that? Hmm, yeah, maybe, I don't know, probably not. And then don't do it or talk to enough people where you have enough information so that you don't make a mistake and offer something that no one's even going to want and look for the things that people will actually want. Um, same thing with the options and opportunities, right? Uh, a lot of these small opportunities that you think are small um, are actually really worthwhile for you, but you won't learn about these opportunities unless you're talking to your customers or that you really have your ear to the ground on what's going on in your neighborhood. Uh, so really, again, keep that in mind. So yeah, um, these are things that you can start doing tomorrow, right? Um, you know, in, if you're not really using Scout to that ability, you can just open up the app, go through your your lists, and it'll tell you who you should be reach, building relationships with. Uh, and finally, uh, before we sign off, I just wanted to tell you about our upcoming webinar. So the next webinar we're going to do is about customer segmentation, which I think really flows well with this because. It'll tell you which customers you should be developing relationships with, personal ones, and which customers maybe you can automate and send automation flows and automation emails to. Um, but again, you know, every customer is different. Some customers don't respond to automation. Some customers respond really well to personalized uh, conversations. So it's going to be about how you determine who those customers are. It's a really cool session. Check it out. Uh, that'll be the next one that is uh, next. Cool. I'll see you then.